Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. We'll uh, go ahead and get started as soon as everyone gets seated. I love seeing a return audience. It's really wonderful. My name is Catherine Foster. I'm the Executive Director here at New Winston Museum. Can I see by a show of hands how many people are here for their first visit? Wonderful. Thank you. I welcome you back. Um, when we have a new exhibit. We're going to be closing for two weeks, or three weeks, and installing a new exhibit that Chris is going to be sharing with you in a little bit. Our mission here at New Winston Museum is to preserve, promote, and uh, present the dynamic history and diverse stories of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County through uh, education and collaboration. One of the ways that we do this is through our salon series, that we invite people, um, community members, to come in and share their stories that they have affected history in Winston-Salem. We recently celebrated our second anniversary in this space, and along with it, we started a new membership program. You'll see in your chairs a membership brochure. I welcome you to become part of um, this new membership program. We do not receive public funds, but what we do need is the support, whether it's membership or board participation, committee work, to help build this little museum that could. So I welcome you to join us with that. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Chris Jordan, who's our Director of Education and Program, to tell you about our exhibits. Well, welcome, everyone. As you can see when you came in, if you've not been here before, on your right on the red back wall is really the exhibit that we opened with over two years ago. Um, we call it Every Picture Tells Our Story. It's a photo timeline of this community from about 1850 through to the present. We're closing after tomorrow and we'll be taking it down. And so if we don't lose this great resource and all these images, it will live on as a digital exhibit that we hope to be launching when we reopen on September 19th. It'll be available in the lobby on a tablet computer as well as um, online. So anywhere in the world, people can access these photos and the stories attached to them. And in many ways, will be uh, more dynamic than it is now because I don't, we don't have to tell you the stories; you can read them yourselves. And um, on the left side of the room is our uh, the War at Home exhibit. Uh, it's been up since last October. It's, it's on the Civil War from the Western Salem perspective, a story that really hasn't been told um, before. And that is also going away um, after tomorrow. And it'll live on in various ways. We're trying to turn it into traveling trunks for the school system and really try to incorporate local history into the curriculum of the Forsyth County public school system, as well as homeschool groups and make these available to all children, regardless of age. Um, and then on September 19th, um, starting next week, we're going to start installing it as a, an exhibit called This School, This City. Some of you I know are, have been involved in it in some way, whether it's taking the survey or you're more actively involved in it. And it is looking at the 50th anniversary of the School of the Arts, but through the lens of Winston-Salem. So through the lens of place, how are, have this new, University of North Carolina School of the Arts and Winston-Salem intersected over 50 years? It's not a comprehensive history of the school, but it's a look at the anecdotal kind of periods of time when the school and the city really had to work together in some kind of way, and what that means to us now. Why should we care that this school that maybe I have no personal affiliation with, why should I care that it's in Winston Salem? Um, I could go into a lot of details. But suffice it to say, it's collaborative in the truest nature of the word, that it's not just uh, them paying us some money or us paying them some money and one of us doing it. We have active players on all sides, many moving parts working on this. It's been very stressful but very exciting. And um, I welcome you to come back to the 19th because this entire space is going to be transformed. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I want to applaud Chris for um, he's just poured himself into this for the past nine months, along with one of our board members, Mike Wakeford, who is at the Division of Liberal Arts at the school, UNCSA. So we're really excited about it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, wonderful guest today. Charlie Lovett was born in Winston-Salem in 1962 and grew up as a child of an English professor at Wake Forest University. He attended Summit School, Woodbury Forest School in Virginia, and Davidson College. In 1984, he went into the antiquarian book business, 
and started his Lewis Carroll collection. Uh, he's written five books about Carroll and countless articles. He served as the president of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America and as the editor of the London-based Lewis Carroll Review. In 1997, he re received an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Art. During this time, he, searched, uh, he researched and wrote Love, Ruth, a book about his mother, Ruth Calder Lovett, who died when he was two years old. Maya Angelou called the book Tender, Sensitive, and True. He and his family have traveled extensively through the United Kingdom and become closely connected with the village of Kingdom in Oxfordshire, where they own a home. In 2001, Charlie's wife, Janice, was hired to oversee the third grade drama program at Summit School where he began to dabble in writing plays. In the ensuing years, as the writer in residence at Summit, he has written plays for third graders, for eighth graders, and ninth graders. Fourteen of the plays have been published. The plays have proven extremely popular and have been seen in over 3,000 productions in all 50 states and more than 20 foreign countries. Charlie has written many novels over the years, but his big break um, came, uh, big breakthrough as a writer came when he put together two of his passions rare books in the English countryside to write the 2013 New York Times bestseller, The Bookman's Tale. His latest novel, First Impressions, follows the mysterious trail featuring another literary master, Jane Austen. Please help me welcome Winston Salem's latest son, Charlie Lovett. Almost everything she said, I could see somebody in the room. Now, Colin, this means you have to go to Davidson now, please. <laughs> One of my one of my former students here in the in the front row. I love it when not everything is filled except for the front four. <laughs> um, this is, went to summit school and is now a senior Woodbury Forest. So we're going to get into dates before. So since this is all about Winston Salem history, I thought what I'd start out with uh, today is just to read you a passage that takes place in Wales. Um, but, it's, but it's the way the book opens. It's nice to be here because this is going to be a little bit different from my usual dog and pony show in that um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes and then I think we're going to talk with each other, Catherine and I. But um, other than this first patch that I'm going to read you, which is really just to give you a taste of the book and how it begins so that we have some frame of reference to talk about it. Um, I do want to talk some about how my living in Winston-Salem and living in North Carolina uh, and being educated largely in North Carolina plays into um, this novel in particular because it doesn't all take place in Wales. But, but I'd like to start by just reading you the opening scene. Pay on Y, Wales, Wednesday, February 15, 1995. Wales can be cold in February. Even without snow or wind, the damp winter air permeated Peter's top coat and settled in his bones as he stood outside one of the dozens of bookshops crowded the narrow streets of hay. Despite the warm glow in the window that illuminated a tantalizing display of Victorian novels, Peter was in no hurry to open the door. It had been nine months since he'd entered a bookshop. Another few minutes wouldn't make a difference. There had been a time when this was all so familiar, so safe, when stepping into a rare bookshop had been a moment of excitement, meeting a fellow book lover, a part of a grand adventure. Peter Byerly was, after all, a bookseller. It was the profession that had brought him to England again and again, and the profession that brought him to Hay on Wye, the famous town of books just over the border in Wales on this dreary afternoon. He had visited Hay many times before, but today was the first time he had ever come alone. Now as the cold ache in his extremities crept toward his core, he saw not a grand adventure, but only an uncomfortable setting, a stranger, and the potential for shyness and unease to descend into anxiety and panic. Anticipation brought cold sweat to the back of his neck. Why had he come? He could be safe in his sitting room with a cup of tea right now, instead of standing on a cold street corner with a sense of dread settling into the pit of his stomach. Before he could change his mind, he forced himself to grasp the door handle, and in another second he was stepping into what should have been welcoming warmth. Afternoon, said a crisp voice through a haze of pipe smoke that hovered over a wide desk. Peter mumbled a few syllables and slipped through an open doorway into the back room, where books lined every wall. He closed his eyes for a moment, imagining the cocoon of books shielding him from all danger, inhaling deeply that familiar scent of cloth and leather and dust and words. His rushing pulse began to slow, and when he opened his eyes, he scanned the shelves for something familiar, a title, an author, a well-remembered dust jacket design, anything that might ground him in the world of the known. 
Just above eye level, he spotted a binding of beautiful blue leather that reminded him of the cap he had used to bind another book. Could it have been nearly 10 years ago? He pulled the book from the shelf, reveling in the smooth, luxurious feel of the leather. Taking a closer look at the gold stamping on the spine, Peter smiled. He knew this book. If not an old friend, it was certainly an acquaintance, and the prospect of spending a few minutes between its covers calmed his nerves. An inquiry into the authenticity of certain miscellaneous papers by Edmund Below was a monument of analysis that unmasked, unmasked one of the great forgers of all time, William Henry Ireland. Ireland had forged documents and letters purporting to be written by William Shakespeare, and even the original manuscripts of Hamlet and King Lear. Peter turned past the marble then papers to the title page. It was a copy of the first edition of 1796. He loved the feel of heavy 18th century paper between his fingers, the texture of the indentations made on the page by the letterpress. He flipped a few pages and read. It has been said that every individual in this country whose mind has been at all cultivated feels a pride in being able to boast of our own great dramatic poet, Shakespeare, as his country. And proportionate to our respect and veneration for that extraordinary man ought to be our care of his fame and of those valuable writings he left us. Peter smiled as he recalled reading those valuable writings from an actual copy of the first folio, that weighty 1623 volume of Shakespeare's works in which so many of his plays were printed for the first time. He was calm now, all sense of dread and panic banished by the simple act of losing himself in an old book. Remembering how that first folio, given the opportunity, always fell open to the third act of Hamlet, he spread the covers of them alone and let the pages fall where they would. The book opened to page 289, revealing a piece of paper about four inches square. The brown foxing on the pages between which the paper had been pressed told Peter it had been there for at least a century. Out of habit or with curiosity, he turned the paper over. The sharp pain that stabbed his chest almost made him drop the book onto the dusty floor. He thought he had outrun that pain, that he could escape it with distance and distraction, that even in the corner of a bookshop in hay on Y it had found him. Knees suddenly weak, he slumped against a bookcase and watched, as if in a dream, as the paper fluttered to the floor. The face was still there. He closed his eyes, willing the face and all that went with it to retreat, willing his pulse to slow once more and his hands to stop shaking. He took a deep breath and opened his eyes. She lay there calmly, serenely, looking up at him, waiting. It was his wife. It was Amanda. But Amanda was dead, buried nine months ago in the red earth of North Carolina, an ocean away, a heartbeat away. And this painting, so much older than Amanda or her mother or her grandmother, could not possibly portray her, but it did. Peter leaned over to retrieve the paper from the floor and examine it more closely. It was an expert watercolor, almost imperceptibly signed with the initials B. B. He looked again at the book from which it had fallen, hoping for a clue to the watercolor's origin. On the front end paper was a penciled interlocking E.H., the monogram of some long forgotten owner. The description printed on a card inside the cover made no mention of a watercolor, only the price, 400 pounds. He'd seen copies cataloged for half that, copies that didn't buy the century-old painting of his dead wife. On the shelf in front of him was a shabby copy of Dickens' unfinished final novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drew. The original cloth binding was worn at the corners and spine. The hinges were broken, and a few pages were loose, but nothing was missing. He could easily restore it to be worth two or three times the asking price. Glancing around, he found himself still alone in the room. His hand trembling, Peter slipped the watercolor into Edwin Drew. He could not leave Amanda here so far from home. He reached out to them alone and tucked Drew under his arm. Twenty minutes later, he had purchased a stack of books, including the Dickens, and was walking toward the car park on the outskirts of town, two heavy bags hanging at his sides. So that's the way this book opens. Um, if Colin was as lucky as I was, he had an assignment at Woodbury junior year that you had to, we had this assignment where we had to take a work of literature and show how the opening passages sort of encapsulated the entire book. Now, if you ever get this um, assignment, and Colin, if you haven't gotten it yet, listen carefully, um, you have two choices. You can do what I did and pick Twelfth Night, which works really, really well, where she knows the opening speech and music be the fruit of love lamp. Or, as it turns out, you have one other choice because uh, we were in Gambier, Ohio uh, earlier this summer for a wedding, 
and they have the second oldest university bookstore in the United States. And they have the bookman's tail shelved under literature. So therefore, it must be. So your other option would be to write about the book of sale. Because and this wasn't really intentional on my part, but I realized in the editing process that I really had sort of written a fairly honest uh, first four pages. Um, everything the book is about is in those pages. It is about, first and foremost, a, a broken man who tries to become less broken. But it's about old books and rambling around the English countryside and William Shakespeare and forgery and petty theft and, and some slightly more serious crimes, but it's all kind of there in the first few pages. Um, when the when the first reviews of the book came out, they could sort of broadly be divided into two categories. There were those reviews, this was categories, about 98% of them, that were not written by antiquarian booksellers. Okay? And then the second category was people who were mad that Peter stole the watercolor. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, go figure, right? Uh, but uh, that sort of led me to think about this. We had a long discussion about the title of the book. The book was originally titled Marginalia because it follows the story of this artifact that has all this writing in the margins, uh, which that would have just been the greatest title ever if we had wanted to sell 46 copies just to <laughs> like rare book librarians and, and uh, antiquarian booksellers. Uh, so eventually we ended up with The Bookman's Tale which is, is great because it's got echoes of Chaucer and it has echoes of The Winter's Tale, which is sort of central to the plot of The Bookman's Tale. Um, but I, have, I can claim no credit for the subtitle, A Novel of Obsession, which was, come up, somebody at Viking came up with that. Um, but it did make me sort of think about the idea of obsession in the context of this book and, and what it is. And I think I found out in that first passage that to me, in the context of, of this novel, obsession is passion free from moral compass. Peter has these two passions that the story follows, is the passion for his wife Amanda and the passion for rare books. And at the point where those passions become so great, he stops sailing to moral true north, he's veering into obsession. Now for Peter, this means things like, you know, not reporting a crime or maybe speeding or stealing a watercolor that's not really worth anything. To some other people in the novel, some, they engage in a little bit more serious acts of obsession. But I promised to get you back to North Carolina, so you heard me almost do that at the end where we talked about where Amanda was buried. The book is told in three time frames. Or as one of my reviewers on Goodreads said, this is an example of how you can tell by the way the review is written, whether you should take that as serious uh, feedback or not. Um, but something on Goodreads wrote, there was like three time periods. <laughs> uh, so there is like three time periods in the book of tale. Um, so the first you just heard the beginning of. The first is this story of Peter Byerly, a widowed antiquarian bookseller who is sort of trying to ease his way back into life a little bit, several months after his wife's death, and uh, living in England, although he's American. And he, he discovers this, um, this book, this artifact, that appears to have a connection to William Shakespeare. And he has to sort of figure out what it is before the whole world comes caving in on him. So that's, a, that's what I would call the front story, the main story of the novel. It takes place in 1995 over a period of about a week or 10 days. Um, the back story of the novel is the story of this particular artifact, this book, and how it moves through time. It starts in uh, 1592 in a tavern on the south bank of the Thames with a bunch of Elizabethan writers sitting together and drinking and making fun of this new upstart guy who's just come to town called William Shakespeare. Uh, and it ends in the 1870s in, in a country house in Oxfordshire. And that particular storyline actually has a lot of real historical characters in it. Um, William Shakespeare shows up for one scene only, poor guy. When they make it into a play, Shakespeare's going to be the actor who's like down at the pub drinking for two hours waiting for the curtain call to come. Uh, and then it's got some 18th century book collectors and some 19th century politicians. And then there's the sort of story in the middle. And that's the story about how Peter came to become passionate about these, these two things, to how he fell in love with rare books and how he fell in love with Amanda. And that story takes place in North Carolina. So finally now we've gotten back to North Carolina. Um, it takes place in the sort of mid-1980s, you know, because Peter is still a fairly young man when he's widowed in 1994 or five. I can't remember how the months work out, four, I guess. Um, and it takes place at a fictional North Carolina university called Richfield University. Now, um, I'll, I'll read to you just a, a paragraph or two 
of, of our how we meet in Ridgefield. I really tried to have connections between these these three different storylines. Sometimes they're really obvious textual connections. Sometimes they're thematic. Sometimes they're um, you know a question of taking a character in a similar situation in one time period and finding a character in a similar situation in the next time period. Um, but the first one is pretty obvious because the first section of the book ends. Um, Peter's just gone through this, this bunch of books that his wife collected to try to find a clue to this mystery. And it says, he slept soundly for the next 12 hours, dreaming of those Royal Academy catalogs and the building where he first encountered them. And then you turn the page and it says, when it opened in 1957, the Robert Ridgefield Library had been the tallest building in Ridgefield, a nine-story neoclassical behemoth of granite and glass, columns and cornices, with an incongruous cupola perched uncomfortably on the top. Um, now, I gotta say that the original draft, um, Ridgefield University was much more shamelessly um, taken from certain local institutions than perhaps it is now. Um, but even in, the, even in the book, the Ridgefields are a, are a very wealthy family who bring the university to town from a place some, down east someplace because they think their town needs a university and they endow it and they build all these nice buildings. In the original draft, I'm slightly ashamed to admit that the uh, library was named after a lost son of the family who was an aviator, but he died in combat. He died in combat, he wasn't barn starving. Um, but I think his name started with a Z, so it was pretty bad. Um, and it's, it's funny when you, you know, when you sit down to try to write a novel again, you don't um, assume, you hope, but you don't assume, okay, this is gonna be the one that's gonna be a New York Times bestseller. This is gonna be the one that's gonna be, came out in Romania this week, you know. Um, but, and so you put all these things in it to amuse your friends who might be the only people who ever read it. You know? uh, so there were like a lot more Lewis Carroll references in the original draft, and there were certainly those things that were much more blatantly way far in the original draft. Uh, and as you get into the editing process, it becomes much easier to say to yourself, okay, now I've figured out what this book is about and which passages are relevant to the story I'm trying to tell, and which things I was just putting in here because I was having fun or showing off my knowledge of rare books or something like that. Um, but nonetheless, there is this fictional um, university. I like to think of it as a conglomeration of, of three great institutions. Um, it is in the eastern part of the state, so in that way, it's a little bit more like Duke University, where my father-in-law went, my brother and sister. Um, it is, the, the layout of the campus to me is very much Davidson, uh, which I, is where I did my undergraduate work. And then the library itself uh, is, is the Wake Forest Library. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any secrets of that. The rare book room is a, a lot fancier than the one they have, but nonetheless it is sort of inspired by that. Um, I gave them a great collection of books. You have to, if it's fictional, why not? <laughs> I've actually had rare book librarians come to me and say, wow, I wish we had that library. Um, <laughs> I've also had rare book librarians come to me and say, I would never let an undergraduate read out of the first folio. You know, one, one of the really interesting things about setting the book when I did is that uh, when Peter has his first encounter with a rare book, uh, he is, it's, it's with the first uh, printing of Hamlet. It's an edition of Hamlet called The Bad Quarto because the text is really lousy. A lot of people think maybe it was actually um, written down by somebody who went to see a performance of a play and then ran home and, and in the days before copyright jotted it down. Can you imagine sitting through four hours of Hamlet and then going home and writing it down from memory and then getting any of it right? But um, so this is sort of Peter's first encounter with a rare book and he puts on these little cotton gloves to change the pages. And I've had young um, people who were in special collections of rare books go, oh no, 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 we don't use cotton gloves. And I was like, you did in 1984. You used cotton gloves back then. Uh, so it's very interesting how uh, the, the book is, people sort of react to it in, in their own kind of time frame for a book that bounces around. So there is a North Carolina connection. We're not, we're not uh, inventing a reason for me to come down here and talk. There, there, there is a North Carolina connection. I had a great time um, talking at Davidson because I was in a classroom with at least this many people and we were just jammed in there cheek by jowl. And right outside the classroom was, was the tree where Peter used to kiss Amanda goodnight before they went to their respective dormitories, you know, and I was just like, oh, that's great. Um, now, I, how many, just out of curiosity, how many people here have actually read The Book of Tale? Oh, a lot. Okay, so I can tell you that when I did a program over at Wake Forest, for those of you who haven't read The Book of Tale, there is late at night on several occasions 
a little hanky-panky that goes on between Peter and Amanda in the rare book room because Peter has the key and that's a good place they can go and get some privacy. You know? And uh, so I, I, I was being introduced, um, I think, by Megan Mulder over at, uh, at Wake Forest in the rare book room. And there were all these students who had come to this program. Um, and she, for some reason, felt the necessity in the, in the course of introducing me to just casually mention that the rare book room at Wake Forest has a 24-hour security camera. <laughs> I don't know why, I really thought that was necessary, but um, it's one of, the, one of the lovely side effects of all of this has been going places and having rare book uh, librarians calling you up and hey, come play show and tell. Um, and I did it, I saw somebody here with an Emory shirt on, I did it at Emory, we, we pulled out great stuff at Emory. We were sitting here looking at a, a, a copy of the Nuremberg Chronicle, which is a book from 1493. Um, it's just, it's a history of Nuremberg, but it's one of the first great illustrated books. It has something like 1,800 woodcuts in it. And it's one of these huge books, printed on the kind of paper that's going to be here long after your Kindle has crumbled to dust. Yeah. And I flipped in the pages and I turned to David Fultz and I said, God, this is great. David, do you know anything about the provenance of this copy? Because I'm always interested in where the history of how the book moved through time. He goes, yeah, that was your great grandfather's copy. <laughs> okay, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Another experience I had was uh, getting the backstage tour, if you will, at the British Library. Uh, and at one point, we were in this room that's just a warehouse of rare books. I mean, there's nothing charming about it at all. And there's a character in uh, The Bookman's Tale, he appears briefly in the final version, he was a little bit more in the earlier cast, named John Bagford. And John Bagford was very famous for his collection of printing samples uh, from sort of the beginning of printing up through about the mid to late 18th century. And uh, advertisements and playbills and tickets and all kinds of things that showed how the process of printing developed over that time period and the history of typefaces and things like this. And so I'm just standing here having a chat with this British librarian guy, and I look up and I see that I'm standing in front of these two huge metal cases that are just filled with these leather bound, as it turns out, scrapbooks that all say John Bagford on the side. And it, that, it was his collection of, of printing samples. It's probably 200 volumes of these things, just amazing. Um, and then it was the experience that I had in Wake Forest, which takes me to um, the next book that's coming out, and then we'll have a little chat. And that is, uh, this is, this is the, what we call the ARC, the Advanced Reader's Copy. It's what we used to call galleys back when they were these big, long, ugly things, but they're gorgeous now. Um, my, my agent likes to start these emails to my editor with, I just have to say, and usually I just have to say is followed by something that you don't really want to hear him say. Like when he saw the original version of the, of the cover design for this, it was, I just have to say, this is completely unacceptable. Um, <laughs> that's why we got such a great cover. So the arcs came out and I got this a copy of this, this email from David and he said, I just have to say, I thought, okay, here it goes. I just have to say this is the most beautiful arcs I've ever seen. Um, and it is, they're really nice. But it's a book about, uh, among other things, Jane Austen. Jane Austen gets a lot more uh, stage time than William Shakespeare did. She is the main character in almost half the book. This, in order to make your lives easier, this book is told in only two time periods instead of three. Um, and one of them is the present day, which I'm always a little bit scared about writing in the present day, because the present day between the time you finish the first draft and the time the book comes out, who knows what kind of cell phones I'll be using. You know? uh, and then the other story is told in uh, 1796, when Jane Austen is about 20 years old, and she's writing the first drafts of the novels that will become Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. What did you do when you were 20 years old? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyhow, um, the day that I finished the, the draft that actually got sent to the, got submitted to, to Penguin, because uh, I, I did a rewrite for my agent. He's like, good, this is good. We're going to send it off there today. So the day I finished that draft, I went over to Wake Forest, and Megan Mulder very kindly pulled out their first edition of Pride and Prejudice, and I sat down and just read the first two or three chapters out of the first edition. If you've never had the experience of reading even a few passages of your favorite book in the form in which it originally was presented to the world, uh, you should really do it. It's a, it's a very cool thing. Um, Sophie, in, in the context of the book, Sophie has an encounter with the first edition of Pride and Prejudice that was really fun to write. Um, so that's coming out on the 16th of October. We're going to have a big book launch over at Summit School with bookmarks, and uh, they're going to send me 
as far south as Miami and as far west as San Diego. So don't bother calling a house between the middle of October and the middle of November. Uh, and First Impressions doesn't really have a North Carolina connection per se. There is one American character in it, but in this case, it all takes place in England. Um, but nonetheless, I grew up in a house with, as you heard, with an English professor who taught 18th century English lit at Wake Forest. So he was going to be Jane Austen sooner or later. There's, there's, no, there's kind of no way around it. You might as well just go ahead. So I think that my, um, although people who don't know me wouldn't, um, might not realize this, I think my life in, in Winston-Salem as a Winston-Salem native um, shapes this very English feeling book um, as well. So I will leave it at that, and then I think we're going to have some discussion. Right? I'm thoroughly entertained. You can just continue <laughs> on. But I do have some Winston Salem related questions okay. as well as just about your process. Um, so thank you for being here. So when you and I met recently, we talked about some of your early memories of Winston Salem, in particular this unnamed library. So um, <laughs> tell us, you know, if you'll share with us just some of your early memories of the Wake Forest campus. Well, I mean, it's funny, when I look back on it, I remember the Wake Forest campus mostly songs students, and I couldn't quite figure that out why until I got older and went to college. And I think it's because I spent so much of my time on the Wake Forest campus on Saturday mornings. <laughs> and not until I was like 19 did I find out what college students are doing on Saturday mornings. They're asleep. You know? <laughs> it's not a time to think. And, but we would go over there. To, it was a great place to ride our bicycles. There was about a third as many buildings as there are now. Um, when my dad first came, he was still his office was in a in a carrel in the in the basement of the library the first year that he was there because they hadn't they hadn't finished all the triple hall yet. Um, keep in mind that, that Summit School and my other sort of connection to to Winston Salem history is having for the 75th anniversary of Summit School and with lots of help from Doug Lewis having written the, the history of Summit School. But Summit was uh, moved to the Renola corridor and was teaching people in Renola ten years before Wake Forest arrived. We got there in 46, and they got there in 56, so you know, it sort of paved the way. Um, but I do remember going, going to Wake Forest, um, hanging out in the library. When I was a, a student at Summit, I would go over and work in the library after school. I'd walk over there, and I would just, we used to have this thing called a card catalog. Anybody remember the card catalog? Yeah. God, I love those. Um, I would just tell my dad in the morning, before he left for his office, would say, what are you working on? I'd be like, I'm working on, um, a paper from Mr. Seaver about chromosome aberration. It's like, okay. And then he'd come find me, and he'd go to the card catalog, and he'd look up chromosome aberrations, figure out where I was, and he'd go and find me and go home. Oh, um, <laughs> so. well, that's rich. That's great. So in Love, Ruth, you um, celebrate your mother's remarkable life. And for what you share with me, um, you can see it a really emotional for your readers, as well as yourself. What All six of them. <laughs> what led you to write her biography, and were there any surprises along the way? Well, there were a couple of things that sort of led into the process. The, the biggest one was that I, I was two years old when my mother passed away, and from the time I was two until the time I was, you know, in my early 30s, if anybody asked me about that, I, my answer was, well, I was only two years old, so I didn't really know her, so, you know, it's all right. You don't have to feel bad for me. And then um, I had my own two-year-old. And it's that whole sort of ar argument got tossed out the window because I started to understand what the relationship is between a parent and a two-year-old. Um, I have a two-year-old niece, almost two-year-old niece right now, and even with her, I, there's a, who I see on rare occasions, there's, a, there's a more of a connection than I had been assuming at the time when I was 16 or 17 or 18 years old. So that was part of it. The other part of it was I was in this MFA program and I had been kind of thinking about maybe exploring this a little bit. And uh, I got the chance to work with um, a great uh, mentor who had just written the book. He's, he had a fiance who was uh, killed in the automobile accident before they were married. And he had written a book about sort of his grieving process. And I just thought, okay, this is great. We, the two of us have to work together. And, and we worked together very intensely for, for six months. It took me probably a year to put the whole thing together. but. Um, and it's, it was a very interesting uh, exercise in understanding the differences between how a, a writer reacts to his own experience and how a reader reacts to that experience. Because I've had people come up to me, you know, years after I've written the book, and I've gone through, yes, I've gone through an emotional experience, but it had been spread out over nine or ten months as I gradually found things out and met people who would, who would know that there's people in this room who knew. Um, 
but uh, then a reader would come to you who's like read the whole book in two days, and they're at this emotional place, and they want you to be at that same place. And it's like, well, okay, I was there like four years ago, eight years ago, whatever, you know, and so that was, that was a good um, lesson to me in, uh, I don't want to say dealing with readers, but understanding the, the kind of reaction a reader is going to have and, and, and trying to sort of reconcile that or, or merge that with, with where you are with the book and, and being respectful of where the reader is, having experienced the material in a shorter period of time and, and in a, a more recent time. I mean, the biggest complaint I've gotten about the book and sales, people will email me and say, well, I was going to try to get some work done this weekend, and um, then I picked your book up on Saturday morning. Um, and I've done that. I mean, I've had I've had that experience of sitting down. And usually, when I get done with an editing task, I try to find a day where I can sit down and read the entire book in one day. But you just kind of have to sort of hold everything in your head at once to be sure that you're not repeating yourself or leaving something out. Um, that's one. Were there any surprises that you you know discovered that you were about my mom? Oh, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. And, and even after the book came out. So I'm working on the Sunday School history. I'm going through some, I'm, I'm going through Doug Lewis's correspondence files. And here's a letter, I pull out, here's a letter from my mom that says, would it be possible to pay the tuition like sort of one month at a time instead of all at the beginning of the year? Which is, you know, it's called the tuition installment plan. She invented it apparently. You know? <laughs> um, so still, I'm still discovering things. The, the biggest surprise in terms of something physical that I can show you because I brought it with me. And I always take this when I'm out on the road, because I talk, the bookman's tale being so much about books and about physical books, I talk a lot about physical books and the things that a, a physical printed book can do that can't be done in a, in a digital environment. Um, and so I was, I, at the time I was working on the book, my, the home that I grew up on over on Robin Hood Road uh, was for sale. My dad and my stepmom were moving out and they had envied the house and the house was on the market. And I thought, you know, that'd be kind of cool to have that experience of going into that empty space that my mother went into. And she, she responded to it as an empty space and said, this is where I want to raise my family. Um, and, you know, I've never seen it empty before. To me, it was always full of stuff and full of siblings, you know. Um, and so I went and I sort of wandered through these empty rooms and it was, you know, kind of interesting. It wasn't my earth shattering or anything. And I went down to the basement. My dad had to study down in the basement where he finished his, his PhD. And uh, it was empty, except that there were these horrible metal bookshelves that were bolted to the wall that they, they had left on there. And just on a whim, I ran my hand across the top of one of these bookshelves, and I found this. This is my mother's high school French textbook. It is covered with marginalia, most of it referring to her boyfriend before my dad. Uh, and then, but the best part about it is I opened up the front cover and I saw this. Yeah. So now you try to block your lipstick on a Kindle and see how well that works. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a little scared about what sort of chemicals she was putting on her lips that it's still that bright red now, <laughs> three years later. But, um, so yeah, there were, there were certainly surprises that and sometimes you go looking for something and, and you find something else. Serendipity, to me, has always been a big part of research. It's one of the things that scares me about our digitization because it Digitization makes it really easy to find what you're looking for, but you don't find what you didn't know you were looking for. Um, and I, my experience as a researcher is full of stories about what was on the book that was next to it on the shelf, what was on the other page of the newspaper, you know, what was on the back of the thing that you thought you wanted to read the front of. So. From what you just shared with us earlier, uh, you seem to be genetically predisposed to book collecting. Um, <laughs> But if you'll share with us, you know, how you got started in that, and, and I'm so curious about your obsession with Lewis Carroll. My father was a book collector. He collected, being an 18th century man, he collected um, Robinson Crusoe, which is a great book to collect because it's been in print constantly since it came out in 1719. So it's like a history of, of modern printing, really. <coughs> um, it started out pre-Industrial <coughs> Revolution and goes right the way through. And it also has been adapted as children's books and, 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 and pop-ups and all kinds of different, <coughs> different ways. Um, so I grew up with this idea, this twin idea, that book collecting was fun. Because I would, whenever I started to travel on my own, I would look for copies of Robinson Crusoe. But also that the idea of collecting a single title was the way that you collected books. That was the only kind of book collecting I'd ever heard of. 
Um, I also grew up listening to these um, Cyril Richard records of Alice in Wonderland that we had up in our attic. I had no idea where they came from. As I started to think about this the other day, I realized how many records we had in our house that I had no idea where they came from. Like, my dad does not seem like the kind of guy who would have bought the Vaughn Meter First Family album, but that's how <laughs> everything I knew about the Kennedy administration until I went to high school, I knew from that album. You know. uh, but uh, so I had this idea that you know collecting would be a fun thing, and that, and that single title collecting would be, would be a fun thing. And as in, in sort of high school and early years of college, I started sort of picking up a few titles, a few copies of Alice in Wonderland. Um, and then Stephanie, who's in the audience today, Stephanie and I went to London in 1984 and went into this bookshop and I, we said, we're kind of interested in Alice in Wonderland. And he came back up with like four boxes of books. And it was one of those sort of Fisher cut bait moments. We were either going to go home with crates of books or we were, or we were not going to pursue this particular um, passion. I knew nothing about Lewis Carroll. Nothing. I had no idea that his, if that wasn't even his real name. And I think what's, what has maintained my passion over the years has been that he turned out to be a really interesting guy, and he turned out to live in a really interesting time period, and he visited places that I think are beautiful places, and just a lot, it's kind of connected in a lot of different ways, most of which have nothing to do with the text from, of Alice. Having said that, everybody go out next year and buy the Penguin Books uh, <laughs> special 150th anniversary edition, because I wrote the uh, introduction for it. This is the first time anybody's ever asked me to write an introduction and there was a paycheck that went with it. It was really yeah. uh, so, uh, That's amazing. So Pastoral England is certainly a central character in, in your work. Uh, what about the people and the places there inspire your writing and how's your Welsh? My Welsh is not good. Um, I have to say, you know, starting out in Wales is a dangerous thing. The, the, right after, this is off the subject, but just on the topic at the beginning of the book. Um, Elmore Leonard passed away about two weeks after the Bookman's Tale was published. And all of my writer and writer-esque uh, friends on Facebook uh, posted this very famous, apparently, I hadn't seen it before, obviously, list of uh, things that Elmore Leonard said, things to never do if you're writing a novel. And the first one was never begin with the weather. <laughs> now, I'm not going to reread the beginning of the Bookman's Tale to you. I'll just let you try to remember how it starts. but. Um, but yeah, I think part of it is that when I when we go to England, we have a, my wife and I have a cottage in England, and we spend a few weeks over there um, every year. And part of it, in terms of the way it connects to my writing, is that is often sort of a recharging time for me. It's a place to go where I'm away from my ordinary life, and so I can think more, and I can see things that are out of the mainstream of my regular life, and not be distracted by um, the telephone ringing off the hook or you know all all the things that distract you in the real world. I think it's harder and harder to do. The distractions are weaving their way over there with email and text messaging and that sort of thing. But so I think that's part of it. Um, part of it is I just I love the English countryside and I think it I think that place for me is very, very connected to narrative. I think it's true in my favorite bits of English literature. It's not necessarily always a real place. I mean Pemberley isn't a real place. If you take Pemberley away from Pride and Prejudice, and what have you got? You know, um, and so for me, being able to experience those places makes a huge difference. The summer before I sat down to write first impressions, um, my daughter was visiting, and my wife and daughter really wanted to go to Highclere Castle, which is where they filmed Down That. Um, it's okay. There are better stately homes to go to. Uh, but it was a lovely day, and the grounds are beautiful. And I looked at the map, and I was like, okay, here's the deal. I will drive you to Highclere Castle. If first, we can leave early, and first we can go to Steventon. Steventon is a village in Hampshire where Jane Austen spent the first 25 years of her life. And it was where I knew I wanted to set a big chunk of this novel. We were in Steventon for 45 minutes. There's nothing to see. The only building that's there that really connects to Jane Austen at all that's still standing is the church. So we spent most of the time either in the church or walking around the church. We drove around some of the lanes nearby. But I lived in those 45 minutes when I came back to write those scenes. Uh, and those, those scenes would have been much harder to write and I think for me would have rung much less true if I hadn't had that opportunity to at least be there. Not just look at a picture, but to actually feel it. You know, I can't really describe it any other way. 
Um, my next novel, I think, as I'm starting it out, is going to the the, um, the Bookman's Tale features a an American university library as its sort of main library. Uh, First Impressions features an English country house library as its main library, and the, and the next book is going to feature a English cathedral library. Uh, so when we were over there in May, uh, April and May, I went to about four different cathedral libraries. Uh, in most cases, they're fairly small rooms that they just let you go stand at the end of and look and go, wow, look at all the old books. And that's about all you can do. Um, at Worcester, we were able to arrange a tour. And I thought, oh, that means there'll be a dozen of us, you know, going to, no, it was Janice, my wife, and myself, and the sub-librarian. And we spent about an hour and a half, and she's just pulling 800-year-old manuscripts off of the, and flipping through, and look, isn't this cool? Check this out. Flipping through pages and everything. Um, it was amazing. Uh, and it's, now that room that we spent an hour and a half in is the room that I see when I sit down to work on, on the book. So I think to me, it's, it's very much about the connection with place and the connection between place and narrative. Let's jump back across the pond to Winston-Salem. And what do you find to be conducive about this you know, you're an internationally known author living in Winston-Salem. Well, um, Winston-Salem has, a, there's a lot of things. First of all, Winston, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have written a lot of what I wrote without Winston-Salem. I wouldn't have become a children's playwright, which was the first way I became an internationally known author, without without Summit School, without Winston-Salem. Um, I wouldn't have gotten sort of the, probably the level of interest in, in history that I gained uh, working on the summit history, you know, if I, had, if I didn't live in Winston-Salem, so you know, a lot of a lot of the things that I that came before this becoming a novelist uh, were, were intricately connected with with my life in Winston-Salem. Uh, that being said, it's a great place to be a writer. I mean, look at this roof. That's all you have to do. They get that many people come out at five thirty in the afternoon on Labor Day weekend. Come on, get out of town. That's awesome. Um, and, and, my, my biggest and best events have all been in Winston-Salem. Now it's true, your author's always gonna have his best events in his hometown, but um, you know, it's, a, it's a town that's very supportive of the arts, obviously, but I think very supportive of the literary arts. It is, I have the great luxury of a fine university library with a great book collection. I mean, no, it's not Harvard or Yale, but if you just wanna go and sort of look at some old books to get inspired, it's just great stuff there. If you want to read a first edition of Pride and Prejudice, it's sitting right there. By the way, if you come to the book launch party for first impressions, the first edition of Pride and Prejudice is coming to the party. So uh, we'll have a little show and tell. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'll get to show and tell, but I think Megan will. Um, so, so in that way, I think it's it's uh, it's very supportive. It's the kind of I mean, it's, it is the kind of town. It's a small enough town that. When I go to the grocery store, somebody comes up and says, hey, I read your book, really enjoy it. Uh, if they didn't enjoy it, I guess they just don't come up to me. Uh, and, and that's nice. I mean, I don't think that would happen if I was working in New York City, or it would happen a lot less often. You know? uh, when, when you're in a smaller town that, that embraces the arts and the literary arts, um, you, know, you, you get to have that one-on-one that -on -one interaction with your readers, which is a great thing, because we're, we're required to do two things as writers. We're required to sit alone in a room for a couple of years. And again, I'm lucky enough to have a really pretty room with a nice view to sit alone in. Um, and then we're, then we're supposed to do this, which is to come and you know, be charming and weak, and, or whatever it is that I'm doing. And um, I think, to me, Winston-Salem is very supportive of the second half of that equation. Uh, but coming coming face to face with your writers, whether it's in a group or one-on-one, or -on -one, makes that sitting alone in the room a lot easier. Because for, to be perfectly honest, in terms of writing book length fiction, for 20 years I was sitting alone in that room, and I was just sitting alone in that room. Imagining this sort of fictional character called the reader who was out there who might read what I was, was writing. And now I've met the reader. I've met hundreds of the reader. You know, and it, it makes it a lot easier to go back in that room and start writing again, because I know who I'm writing for. They're actual real people that I'm facing this. And, and it's nice to live in a town where you have that experience on an almost daily basis. So if you were to write a book specifically about Winston-Salem, who would be the main character? <laughs> it's so funny. When she asked me this question the other day, I thought, how am I going to come up with an answer? And then it took me two seconds to see the most obvious answer in the book. Catherine Reynolds. Um, she was unbelievable. And I, I learned a little bit about her when I was, when I was researching the summit. 
history and more about her since then, um, in particular about the Ronaldo School. But this is a woman without whom we would not have, obviously, Ronaldo House of Gardens, which means we would not have Wake Forest University. We probably wouldn't have Summit School. We wouldn't have um, uh, R.J. Reynolds High School or Reynolds Auditorium. And those are just like the obvious things that she personally was involved in before you get to the things where, where the dominoes start to topple. Um, she was so ahead of her time, the things that she did in her young life just amazed me. She was, you know, in the, in, before the First World War, she was trying to get her husband to put a daycare center into a factory. Can you imagine? Um, when, she, when she died, the whole city closed down. It was the first, her, her public memorial service was a private service at, at what's now Ronald Presbyterian Church. But it was a public service um, at, at Reynolds Auditorium. It was the first public event on Reynolds Auditorium. It only been open about three weeks. Um, and when they, when they drove from Ronaldo down to the cemetery down by Salem where she's buried, the, they said the, the, the streets were just lined with people, you know, multiple people deep the whole way, the whole town. So I think she's an, an incredible woman. I think we have many, many things to thank her for. Um, and, I, and I think she would be especially good in a movie. Because mm -hmm. um, people, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll warn you right now, when you write a book, people are going to want to know, is it going to be a movie? It's the, it's the number one question. I think there should definitely be a movie of Catherine Reynolds' life. Who would be the star? That, I would have to ask my wife. She's such, so good at casting. Um, she would, uh, we, had, we had to play this game. I got asked to do a guest blog for a blog called My Book of the Movie. And we had to cast the book in sale. It was hard. Um, but we've got first impressions pretty well lined up. We're not quite sure like who's going to be Jane Austen. But Sophie's uncle and her father, who are brothers, are going to be um, Stephen Fry and um, uh, the other one, uh, House. You know, yeah, uh, Hugh Laurie. Yes, uh, Hugh Laurie. Uh, we're going to reunite them. And her mother's going to be Emma Thompson. So, you know. Oh, <laughs> You can dream about these things. So. I, can, I can see Jennifer Ely as Captain Reynolds. She's a great local. Um, yeah, that would be nice to bring the bring it full circle. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, you read to us from Bookman's Tale. Thank you for doing that. What's it like to? What's it feel like to be a New York Times bestselling author? Um, you know, nothing really changes about who you are. It's it's very interesting because I've met all these other New York Times bestselling authors and. Uh, turns out we're mostly fairly normal people. Um, there, I mean, it's it, the nicest thing about it is that when I was working on first impressions, I had you know an agent and an editor, and the president of Penguin Books waiting to read it. You know, that's nice. That's a, uh, and it um, it does change the way that people look at your work. I had I have a book coming out next year um, that I wrote more than ten years ago. It is a, uh, a, I don't know, we're still arguing over the title. We always argue over titles. But um, it is a, basically it's a sequel to Charles Dickens' novella, The Christmas Carol, written as if it had been written by Charles Dickens. It, it is part parody and part pastiche. There are sections in it where Dickens fans will maybe recognize sentences or maybe even whole paragraphs that have been lifted from obscure Dickens works and worked into it. Um, so I actually had an agent for this um, when I first wrote it, a decade or so ago. Um, by the way, I wrote most of it during study hall when I was a long-term sub at Summit School. So I mean, thank, <laughs> I thank the fact that most of my study hall kids were in PE. That, you know, that, um, and I wrote some of it when we went to England for Christmas that year. I remember sitting in Canterbury Cathedral waiting for Christmas Eve services to start. And I, had, I was working on the manuscript. So I had an agent, and he sent it to five or six publishers. For all I know, he sent it to me. And they all turned it down, and he said, I'm done with you, and that was that. And then uh, I was in my editor's office. Catherine Court, my editor, is the, it's so complicated. She's the president of Penguin USA, which is owned by the Penguin Group, which is owned by Random House, which is probably owned by the Koch brothers. I don't know. You can't even know. Um, but um, we had a, we, were, we like to have these kind of what is next uh, conversations. And I floated two or three ideas. And I said, and I have this Christmas question. I'd like to see that. And I hadn't even read it in years. And I sent it to my agent without, I was in our, I was getting ready to go on tour, so I had no time for editing or anything. I just sent it to him without even looking at it. And he sent it to Catherine and she bought it. So um, I don't think that would have happened if the Bookman's Tale had sold 2,000 copies. And so it does, it, it certainly is a very helpful thing for, for getting people to look at your other work. That being said, 
Um, the publisher approaches work, any work, um, with the question of, you know, can, can this sell? And, and also, do we have a reasonable belief that this is going to continue Charlie's forward trajectory? Trajectory. And so she's, just because I wrote it, she's not automatically a mom. It's not, I'm not uh, James Patterson or Stephen King yet, you know, but, but at least she's going to read it and seriously consider if it can be whipped into shape. <laughs> What's your favorite Dickensian man? Oh, I don't know. Uriah Heap always comes up in the uh, crossword puzzles a lot. So uh, I, I just love that he can, and I think the only modern author who does this is J.K. Rowling, that he can, in, in three or four syllables of somebody's name, tell you everything you need to know about that person. <laughs> I love it in life when you meet someone with a Dickensian name and, yeah. and they live up to them. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have covered, you know, kind of most of material that you and I discussed, and I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions to the audience. Yes, sir. You just happened to mention, Charlie, that uh, uh, you need to sell so many books to be successful. So my question is, what do publishers look for to be a successful run of a book? Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. It's And it's a very complicated question now because the ebook, you know, formula plugs into that, and the publisher's risk level with electronic books is obviously much lower because it doesn't cost much of anything to produce them once you produce the first one. I mean, once you produce the first one of these, which is where all the effort goes in, it still costs them a few dollars to produce every other hardback copy that they produce. But once you produce the first electronic book, it costs you virtually nothing to produce as many copies as you want. So that complicates the, the formula. Um, it's... Uh, I had seen yeah, the I, number. I don't know. I would, I'm not sure where the break-even point is these days. I've seen but the number of 5,000 books would be considered a pop page. I would imagine that probably somewhere around 5,000 would be um, would be considered a success. For, you know, and again, for a major publisher, it depends on you know smaller publishers. I've, I've published a lot of books with academic presses, and they were very happy to sell 700 copies, you know, because that's what they're set up to do, is to set, sell copies for 80 bucks a piece to a university library. And uh, so, it, so it does depend. But in terms of you know a novel with a major publisher, I would think that's probably a reasonable um, uh, breaking point. But it's it's complicated with with all the different. You know, we've got with Bookman's Tale, you have you have the hardcover. Now the paperback is out. Um, then you had the bit large print edition that was uh, sold through Penguin. The audio book. Uh, then it was a book of the month club uh, selection, and that's just the U.S. market. Then it was sold to a to a separate publisher in Britain, a separate publisher in Australia, and 10, so far, foreign language editions, um, including worldwide Spanish, which just came out. So that's actually a larger market than the North American market. So it's, you know, um, but I imagine 5,000 is probably not far off in terms of a major New York publisher looking for, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll take the second book too. They publish a lot of books. A lot of first novels get published. I'm really lucky and excited about the fact that I kind of have a second novel published. I mean, people say to me, well, what if First Impressions is, you know, doesn't do very well? I'm like, then I had a New York Times bestseller and I had a second book published by Penguin. Sorry, I'm going to take that as a win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I was Yeah, it's really interesting because they came to they came around to that after a lot of other possible designs, which my editor did not show me because she said they were all horrible. Although I did see one of them lying on her desk uh, when I wasn't supposed to look. But um, yeah, if you look at these, there are there are definitely some some major similarities in the in the cover design in terms of you've got a sort of a scene at the bottom and you've got this burnt off thing at the top with the face. I just love Sophie up here. She's she's got this perfect nail polish on, and yet she's just completely into this book or manuscript or whatever it is that she's she's reading. And to me, that that really captures her. It's interesting if you compare this to the paperback. Um, this could be one of two people up here in the corner. But in the paperback, she's not looking demurely down. She's staring right out at you in sort of a almost creepy fashion. Um, but yeah, I do agree that if you see first impressions, you might go, oh, I think I read another book by that guy. And I like that about the cover. And yet I think the cover, again, is very honest about you know, what 
what's inside. Um, this, this painting at the bottom is actually a slightly altered version of a painting that hangs in Chawton House, which is uh, Jane Austen's brother's house. And she, she lived in a cottage on that estate for the last uh, several years of her life uh, in Chawton Cottage. And I went on this, Chawton House was bought, the leasehold was bought by an American philanthropist. And she fixed the place up and installed in it her collection of um, 18th century women writers. It's an amazing collection. Uh, it runs. It actually runs from about 1650 till about um, 1820 or so. But it's, it's all women writers, mostly English novelists. Uh, and it's a research library now, and, and you can have your wedding there. But, but on Tuesdays, if you make it arrangement ahead of time, you can go take a tour. So we're walking through, and all of a sudden, I see this painting hanging there. I had no idea where this came from, and uh, it was one of those sort of aha moments. You know? And I said, can you tell me what that is? And they said, well, it's this house, but you don't recognize it because it's painted from the side across. You have to walk across the sheep fields to see that angle. Um, and I said, well, it's on, the, it's on the cover of my novels. <laughs> More questions? Yeah, there's a question here. Well, uh, thank you, Charlie, for being with us. I cannot wait to see what comes next and continued success with your next book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think, I think um, <laughs> for the four of you who have not read the book yet, there we do have some copies. The book Marks has brought very kindly brought some copies over for for sale. And if you want it to be defaced, I have a pen that I can defaced it. Uh, <laughs> thank so, you so much. Thank you.